Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is going to be a two part training. So we have tonight to talk about bumblebee ecology and some of the threats they're facing. And then tomorrow night will be the second part where we really dive into how the project works, how you conduct surveys and everything good. So we're going to get started tonight. My name is Katie Lampke. I'm a conservation biologist with the Xerces Society. I am based in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I run the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas, the Missouri Bumblebee Atlas, as well as the Great Plains Bumblebee Atlas. And Rich Hatfield is also joining us tonight. Rich, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rich Hatfield. I'm a senior conservation biologist with the Xerces Society and lead our bumblebee conservation programs all across North America. Um, started this concept of bumblebee atlases in the Pacific Northwest, which we've been running in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho since 2018, and now have over 1,200 volunteers that have contributed almost 35,000 records of bumblebees. So looking forward to um, seeing this program and project develop over the next several years, and really want to thank you all for spending your time with us tonight, and um, look forward to, to watching this program grow. So thanks a lot. And then we also have our partners with the Fish and Wildlife here tonight. Um, we have partners in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Kansas. Um, Charlie, would you like to introduce yourself next? Hi, I'm Charlie, um, otherwise known as Charlene Beskin. I'm in the um, PEER office, uh, PEER Ecological Services field office. Um, what else do I want to say? <laughs> I'm sort of brain dead. I've been, I have had kids out at a butterfly garden all day. Um, but promoting pollinators for the last several years because they're a hot topic and they're something that really needs help. So um, that's how this project got going. So I'm glad all the participants are on and I hope you find lots of bumblebees this year. So that's all. Thank you. Dan, do you want to go next? Sure, I'm uh, Dan Kim. I'm also from the South Dakota field office in Pier. Uh, Charlie and I uh, found the uh, Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas online and got all excited and we begged and borrowed and stole money to try and, and help get the Great Plains Bumblebee Atlas going. And I'm just pleased as punch that we're getting started off here. And like Charlie, I hope we find a whole bunch of bumblebees this year. All right, and then Laura, do you wanna go next? Sure, I have uh, a baby with me temporarily. He'll be going away soon. But uh, my name is Laura Mendenhall. I'm a biologist with Fish and Wildlife Service in Kansas in the Manhattan <laughs> office. Very excited about this effort, starting to see more bumblebees out here in Kansas. So looking forward to the training. Thanks. Last but certainly not least, we have Jerry. Good evening, all. Uh, this, I'm Jerry Reinish. I'm a biologist with Ecological Services and Bismarck, North Dakota, and uh, we saw our first bumblebee today, so we're excited. Hopefully, it'll be a lot better than last year's sampling, and I uh, look forward to everyone getting involved and in, uh, covering the whole state of North Dakota. Nice. It's exciting that you saw the first bumblebee today. That's a good sign. Okay, so here's our outline. Um, Again, this is a two-part training, and you want to make sure that you're signed up for both tonight and tomorrow's workshop if you want to participate in the Bumblebee Atlas, just to make sure that you have an understanding of how the project works and what you're going to be asked to do if you sign up. So if you want to register for part two, if you haven't yet, you can go to bumblebeeatlas.org slash gpevents, and we can post a link to that in the chat as well. All right, so the Xerces Society, um, we are a nonprofit science-based organization that works to conserve invertebrates as well as the habitat that supports them. A lot of people get thrown off by our name initially, um, but we are named after the Xerces blue butterfly, which was the first butterfly known to go extinct from human causes here in North America. So we work with invertebrates because they are found in nearly every ecosystem 
they all play vital roles in helping to maintain the earth and they help with decomposition, whether it's a dung beetle, recycling nutrients into the ground, um, they help with biocontrol, they're the base of the food chain for both aquatic and terrestrial environments. They help with pollination, water filtration. Um, there's been recent figures that estimate there are nearly 200 million insects on the planet for each human. So there's a lot of different invertebrates out there that are all really helping to keep our ecosystem in check. So the way that Xerces works is through conservation, advocacy, research, and education. So we have an amazing team of nearly 70 individuals that do on the ground conservation. Um, we've supported pollinator habitat restoration on over 900,000 acres and protected and restored over one and a half million acres for rare and at-risk invertebrates. Um, we also work to advocate for policies that encourage the conservation of invertebrates. So here we have our executive director Scott Hoffman Black out there doing the important work. We also work in education and training. So we've given um, trainings to all 50 states, including Canada, Mexico, Europe, and Asia, and provided outreach to over 100,000 professionals since 2008. So we do a lot of work with public and private landowners, farmers, producers, to work to understand the habitat and how we can better support those at-risk species. We also have our hands on a lot of community science projects. So Bumblebee Watch and the Atlas program that we're gonna talk about tonight, but also things like the Monarch Thanksgiving Counts, Pond Watch, Western Milkweed Mapper, Freshwater Mussel Surveys, lots of different programs to get people involved in conserving invertebrates. And the wonderful thing about Xerces is that we are a donor supported nonprofit. So thank you to everyone who has logged on tonight that is already a donor. I think we have about 13,000 members right now. Um, if you would like to support Xerxes to continue doing the work that we do, you can log on to xerxes.org slash donate. And now we're going to dive into pollinators. So a quick refresher for anyone that hasn't visited this section since third grade or whenever we first learn about it. Um, pollination is when an animal, which is usually an insect, which is usually a bee, picks up pollen grains from the male part of a flower and flies them over to the female part of the flower and deposits them. This allows the plant to reproduce. And as these plants are reproducing and growing, um, the pollinators are also lending their services to maintain diverse plant communities. And we know that diverse plant communities are better able to withstand threats, right? So the more different species there are on the landscape, the more resilient that ecosystem should be because the plants are helping with nutrient cycling, soil stability, water filtration, carbon sequestration. And all the while, they're also providing nesting habitat and food for animals of all sizes, right? From our smaller songbirds, all the way up to things like grizzly bears and bobcats. Even the pollinators themselves end up being food for a lot of these organisms. So they're important in our natural areas, in our agricultural areas, but they're also important um, just for our human well being. So Xerces had the opportunity to partner with Whole Foods a number of years ago. And what we did was remove all of the fruits and vegetables. Everything that needed pollination was removed from the shot. And this is what it looked like. So we wouldn't completely starve if pollinators went away, but we would certainly lose a lot of that nutritional value and amino acids that we need to have a healthy diet. And for all of those reasons, we consider pollinators to be a keystone species. And a keystone species is an organism that has a disproportionately large role in their environment. So another way to think about that is if we were to remove pollinators from the ecosystem we know today, think how differently it would look, right? If all of those plants weren't being pollinated, the animals didn't have places to nest or a lot of food to eat, if we didn't have our diet, um, things would function a lot differently. So the main groups of insect pollinators include butterflies, flies, moths, wasps, beetles, and bees. But the most important insect pollinator is a bee. 
And that's for a few different reasons. So the first one is that bees are the only insect to consume nectar and pollen as both larvae and adults. So they're constantly visiting flowers, right? They need that food source at all stages of their life cycle. And because of that, through time, bees have evolved these really specialized structures that allow them to collect and transport mass amounts of pollen to and from the nest. So on this bee's hind leg here, you can see that she has these really, really dense branched hairs that are called scopi. And these are specialized hairs used for pollen transportation. So when she's visiting a flower, she can pack her hind leg full of pollen and fly it back to the nest and brush it off. And there's many different kinds of ways that bees can collect pollen. Um, most often it's on the hind leg. It can also be on the underside of their abdomen. It can be in their crop, sort of like um, in their mouth, they'll hold it more in a liquidy format. So here's another form that's called a pollen basket or a curricula, which is what we see on bumblebees. And this one is essentially a hollowed out basket, right, that shiny part there. The bumblebees pack that area full of pollen and are able to fly back to their nest with this huge basket of food. So here we've got a picture of a bumblebee that has an extremely full pollen basket. I'm not sure how she even fit that much on there. Um, and I keep saying she with the bees because only female bees collect pollen. So the last thing that makes bees the most effective pollinator is this behavior that they exhibit called flower constancy. So this is when a bee is leaving their nest and they're gonna go out on a foraging trip. When that bee is presented with a field of choices, right? Maybe they see roses, maybe they see daisies, maybe they see mints. The bee is gonna choose to go to the same type of flower on that single foraging trip and then go back to her nest. And the reason for that is that she's ensuring cross-pollination is happening, right? Because the mint flower needs the mint pollen. So the bees and the flowers have this really nice mutual relationship going on that they've figured out how to um, persist together. But when a lot of people think of a bee, we think of a honeybee, right? Because it's an object of familiarity. We've learned about them at some point in our life because they're a really great tool for education. Um, they're really valuable to our agricultural system. They're just fascinating creatures. But most of us don't think about wild bees and all of the other species that are out there. And those are the ones that we're gonna be talking about tonight. So we're gonna do a little poll here. Uh, there it is. So how many different species of wild native bees are found in the United States? Let's we'll take a few seconds and answer this. All right, well, the majority of you got it right, um, but it looks like a few of us will learn something tonight. So in the United States, there are about 3,600 different species of wild bees. And when we look at wild bees, um, there is diversity in color, in size, in shape, in lifestyle, in pollen collecting, in diet, so many different ways that bees can be different. And throughout the world, there's at least 20,000 known species right now. And here's another way to look at that. This is a pie chart of all the different bee species in the United States by their family. So the big difference between our wild bees and honeybees are that most of these species are solitary. There's no hive, there's no management going on, there's no queens and workers. It's just a single female bee who takes care of the pollen collecting, the nest creating, the egg laying, and she does that all throughout the summer. And then at the end of the summer when she's laid all of her eggs, she will die off, right? And of course there's many, many different season lengths. So some bees may only be out for about four weeks. Some bees will be out for the whole summer. There's a lot of variety in the ways that bees persist on the landscape. 
Um, 65 percent of the bees are ground nesting, um, meaning they may dig really deep tunnels into the ground. They may use pre-existing cavities like a rodent hole that's in the ground. 35% um, of the bees are above ground cavity nesters. So if you think about those bee blocks that have been becoming more popular, it's like a block of wood with some holes in it or some little tunnel nests. Those above ground cavity nesting bees are what you'll find in there, which might be leaf cutter bees or resin bees. Um, and bumblebees surprisingly only represent about 1.4% of the bees in North America here. So just to look at some of our other beautiful wild bees, I wanted to show a few pictures here. This is a small carpenter bee. This beautiful dark blue metallic bee is a stem nester. So this bee might nest in rose stems or blackberry stems, stems of big blue, um, anything that's got a pretty good size hole, but that's pithy, right? So this bee will chew through the pithiness of the plant stem and create her nest in there. We've also got sweat bees. And this one, if you look close enough, you'll actually see that it's sort of a metallic gold green color. Um, and all of those little pink dots on her hind leg are pollen grains. So just like bees, pollen comes in all different kinds of colors. There's pollen that's blue, green, yellow, pink, orange, um, really runs the spectrum. We also have bees that depending on which way you look at them, they could appear purple, they could appear green, they could appear blue. And then we have the beautiful fuzzy bumblebees. Um, these species are more adapted for the cooler climates. So they're covered with a lot more dense hair, if you will. And they're also a lot larger than some of our other native bees. So these are the species that we really need to start thinking about when we're thinking about our natural areas and even supporting rangelands, right? These are the native species that are going to be helping provide those pollination services. All right, do we have any questions on that first part? Yeah, there's one question here, Katie, that says, at what point will above ground nesting bees be out of their nest? When can I safely clean up my yard? Great question. Great question. Yeah, um, I think there's, there's a little bit of back and forth on when, when you should do that. Um, the most important thing with those above ground nesting bees, the cavity blocks that you have, is to make sure that you clean them. So once the bees, you'll see that they've left when they've chewed through the leaf or the mud or the resin, whatever they've clogged that hole with, if it's chewed through, the bee has left. Um, before you leave it up for the next season's bees to come in and nest, you wanna make sure to clean that out so that any parasites or diseases that are in there will not affect the season's bees. Okay, let's move into ecology then. There we go. All right, so we're gonna look at bumblebees and their value as pollinators now and how they sort of differentiate from some of our other wild bees. And the main categories that we're going to talk about tonight are physiology and the bumblebee's ability to fly in cold and wet conditions. We're also going to talk about their intelligence and their ability to learn to access resources. We're going to talk about some of their modifications like long tongues. Um, and then we're going to look at their innovation and how they can use their strength to their advantage. So the first one is physiology. So bumblebees are capable of muscular thermogenesis, which is a fancy way of saying that bumblebees can sort of regulate their temperature by using their muscles to generate heat. Um, and they're able to basically turn off their wing muscles and shiver themselves so that they can heat up. And by doing this, it allows them to fly earlier in the day when some smaller bees might not be able to because it's too cold. Um, they can also fly in cooler and wetter conditions 
because they're able to generate that heat themselves. And tongue length. So this might sound kind of silly, but we look at tongue length of bumblebees and we also look at cheek length, which sounds very minute and small, but it is. Relatively in the world of bees, I feel like these tongues and cheeks are pretty large though. So you take what you can get. Um, bumblebees relative to other bees have long tongues. So they're able to access nectar from a wide variety of flowers that have these longer spurs, right? So a smaller bee that has a smaller tongue might not be able to access the nectar shown in these flowers here. Um, bumblebee tongues can vary from six to eight millimeters. So bumblebees as a whole have long tongues, but even within there are short tongue bumblebees and long tongue bumblebees. And that's something that we're gonna talk about tomorrow night as well, because it feeds into the different species that you might see. And buzz pollination. So this is um, another example of bumblebees using their flight muscles. So this is called buzz pollination and it happens with plants like tomatoes, peppers, these flowers that hold their pollen really tightly inside um, the anthers. And so in order for the anthers to drop the pollen or the female, I'm sorry, in order for the male parts of the flower to drop the pollen, they need to be really vigorously vibrated. So the bumblebee is able to grab onto this flower, turn off her wing muscles, but still use those vibrations to dislodge pollen grains that then fall onto her abdomen that she's able to collect in her pollen basket. So there's a wide variety of flowers that need this service. Um, bumblebees are some of the only ones that are capable of this, which is why you might see commercial tomato growers using bumblebees in their greenhouses because um, it can increase seed set. So you could see them on shooting stars, sunnas, pitcher plants, squash, um, some people have also developed the, it's like a manual buzz pollinator that you can buy at garden stores. It's essentially like a, an electric toothbrush that you can use to brush up against your tomato plants or your pepper plants to help dislodge that pollen. So here we have a little gif of buzz pollination taking place. And if you look really closely at the tip of the yellow part in the center, you can see these really tiny pollen grains shooting out of the anthers. And the bumblebee is going to be collecting that pollen. OK, and then here we have a little video looking at the intelligence of bumblebees. So this research actually shows that bumblebees are capable of learning and teaching and then using that knowledge to make efficient choices. Let's see if it starts here. Okay, so here they're training the bumblebee. They're saying, hey, if you move this yellow ball into the center, we will give you a nectar reward. So the bee is checking it out, finds the nectar, and then they put the bee to the test. And after training, she's able to take the bee her take the ball and move it into the center. And she gets her nectar reward. And then they can show others like, hey, look, if we move this bee to the center, watch this, we get a treat. And then they can make choices using what they've learned. So the bee is gonna fly around these and choose the ball that is the closest to the center because she knows that will give her the fastest nectar reward. So these creatures are pretty amazing. Um, there's probably a lot that we don't know about them yet. But I feel like everything that we keep learning is just blows your mind a little more each time with how small something can be, but how intelligent it can be at the same time. So now we're going to do another poll here. Now we're going to ask how many different species of bumblebees are found in the United States. So there were about 3,600 wild bees. How many of those are bumblebees?
might be a little confusing for folks as the poll questions are different than the numbers on your slides there, Katie. Oh, indeed. All right, we'll, we'll give it a freebie. Um, if you guessed over 40, you're in the clear. Let me get the slide to start working again. <laughs> Sounds good. There we go. So there are about 47 species in the US. <clears throat> oh, there it is. All right, so if you guessed between 30 and 45, over 45, you can count it as correct tonight. Okay, so here we have a map of bumblebee diversity. And the areas in red that you see on the map are areas where we find um, the most species of bumblebees. So bumblebees are more adapted to those cooler alpine mountainous regions. So if you go out west, um, up to the mountains, you're more likely to find more species. Historically, North Dakota has seen about 25 species of bumblebees. South Dakota has seen 29 species, a few more because the Black Hills, right? They're a hotspot for biodiversity. Kansas has about 12 because it's getting into a little bit warmer region, but between all three states, there are 31 different species. And that's because there might be species in Kansas that don't quite make it up to North Dakota and vice versa. So looking at the bumblebee colony, um, bumblebees are social organisms. So they're made up of a queen, worker bees, and males. Worker bees are always female and bumblebees work off of an annual life cycle. That's um, basically means they are active on the landscape from about, depending on where you are, April to October. In North Dakota, that might be Jerry said he found a bumblebee today, so mid-May to um, whenever the flowers start to die off in fall. The colony is founded by a single queen each spring. Um, and the colonies, depending on the species and the climate and the available quality and quantity of forage resources, can contain anywhere between 25 and 1,000 workers. And the nests are generally found in abandoned rodent burrows, bunch grasses, unmowed areas, rock walls. I like to think of them as messy areas, right? just these untamed natural areas, the bumblebees like those. So in spring, um, like I said, the nests are established by the mated queen. So bumblebees mate in fall, and then the queen will hibernate and emerge in springtime to start the nest. So the queen, after she emerges, will spend about two to three weeks looking for a suitable nest site. Um, if it's a really good nest site, queens might fight over the location. Um, all of the sites, whether they nest above ground or below ground, need pre-existing insulation. So abandoned rodent burrows are common. Um, bluebird boxes are also common. Exposed housing insulation is common. Um, and then when she begins starting the nest, she begins producing wax using glands on the underside of her abdomen. And she will go out and forage and collect pollen and nectar for herself, but also for the eggs that she's going to be laying in these wax pots that she's making. Then she'll split her time between incubating her clutch of eggs and foraging. So it's a pretty busy and vulnerable time for her because she's the only organism on the landscape right now. She'll then keep laying successive clutches of eggs. And then throughout the summer, the colony really just focuses on growth. So it takes about four to six weeks from an egg to get to an adult. Um, the eggs are in a regularly functioning nest, only laid by queens. Um, the eggs are laid on pollen cakes, which is a mixture of pollen and a little bit of nectar. And as the eggs hatch into larvae, they're tended to by the queen and the workers. And then the larva transforms into a pupa, which is the in-between stage of the larva and the, the adult. And then the adult 
um, <clears throat> the adults come out and as more worker bees are present in the nest, they will slowly take over wax production, right? Because it's a very energetically expensive task and the queen needs to focus on egg laying. The workers will also take over a lot of the foraging duties. Um, they will also take over defense of the nest and maintenance of the nest. They will help nurse the bees. Um, they will grow the nest they need to and provide more insulation for those spots that are kind of expanding. And then um, later in the summer, the colony will switch from rearing worker bees and into rearing new queens and males. And these new queens and males will leave the nest to mate with other surrounding members. Um, and after mating takes place, the male bees will die off and the mated queen will go back to the nest for a little bit and she will utilize any of the resources of the remaining workers. But those workers are also going to die off as is the founder's queen. So in late summer, or early fall, um, the only active member is going to be that mated queen. And she'll spend about a week or two looking for foraging resources because she needs to build up fat reserves for the winter. Um, she'll then fly around and search for a spot to overwinter, which is called a hibernaculum. And this is a short burrow that she'll dig into the ground. It can be in soil, usually on northern sloped areas under trees and rotten wood, under leaf litter, mossy areas, areas of bare ground, um, probably a lot more that we don't know about because it's very hard to find these hibernating queen bumblebees. So it's definitely an area that we're lacking research. Um, but she'll stay here until the following spring. So about six to nine months, the queens are hibernating by themselves. So here we have the life cycle sort of laid out in one diagram. Starting on the left, we have the queens in spring, right? So she's emerging. She's going to start looking for that nest location, foraging, begin laying her eggs. Throughout the bulk of the summer, the colony is growing, they're foraging. Um, and then late in the summer is when we see the new queens and the males come out mate and down in the bottom of that box there you can see that the old queen is beginning to look a little scraggly she's going to expire soon the nest is degrading um, and winter time will be when the queen is spending her time underground so there are also cuckoo bumblebees if you are familiar with um, <clears throat> birds at all and know about cuckoo birds Cuckoo bumblebees exhibit a very similar lifestyle. So these, these types are essentially an evolved kind of bumblebee, right? They don't build their own nest. They don't forage for their own resources. They don't produce workers. They essentially invade a nest that is already existing and take it over. So the queen that's going to invade, the cuckoo bee that's gonna invade the nest has to do it at a very pivotal time, right? Because she doesn't want the bumblebee nest to be so big that they kill the invading cuckoo. She wants there to be enough workers in the nest that when she begins laying eggs, those worker bees will take care of the cuckoo eggs. So the queen bee comes in, or the cuckoo bee comes in and she'll use a mixture of aggression and pheromones um, and try to kill the queen take over the nest and begin laying her own eggs. The cuckoo bees typically have very strong stingers and a thicker exoskeleton that helps um, aid them during the defense when they're invading. And uncertainty. So of all the things we just covered about the life cycle, there are certainly a lot of things that we don't know yet or have very little information on, um, including nesting biology, right? So we've been able to rear a few species of bumblebees in a lab very well, and we've learned a lot about them, but it doesn't always translate to what's happening in wild populations or what's happening across different species. 
Um, like I mentioned earlier with hibernation, it's very hard to come across queen bumblebees when they're hibernating. So, you know, there's just naturally a lack of data there. Same with queen and male dispersal in the fall and the spring. Um, it can be difficult to track bumblebees and find out how far they're leaving their natal nest, um, whether that be in the spring or the fall, or how far the males will go to mate, how far the queens will go to mate. And same with reproduction, ecology of males, and threats of stressors. So there's a lot that we do know about bumblebees, but there is certainly a lot that we don't know about bumblebees. And Rich is going to talk to us now about threats and stressors. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. We can answer some questions while you get yours up. Yeah, Katie, there's a few questions about sort of life history and um, the differences between bumblebees and native bees in their life, life histories. Um, I think there's just a lot of information in that slide. So there's one question from Lynette that says, I thought you said native bees are solitary, but now you're telling us that bumblebees live in a colony? <laughs> Tell oh, me more about that. Great question, great question. Most bees are solitary, most of the wild bees. There are a few species of native bees or wild bees that are social. So some of our sweat bees are social bees that live in a colony. Bumblebees are social bees that live in a colony. Um, there is also a spectrum of sociality. So there are some bees that are semi-social. There are some bees that maybe live in an aggregate, but they're not truly social, right? So you can think of it as like an apartment complex. There's a bunch of bees that live in one area, but they all have their own nest that they take care of. And then um, Catherine asks, when and how do the worker bees arrive on the scene? Is there a stork involved? <laughs> I had the stork part. <laughs> um, the worker bees, so when the queen starts up the nest, she begins laying those eggs and those eggs will hatch into larvae. The larvae will grow into pupa and the pupa will emerge as an adult. So it's through a process of metamorphosis and through the queen continuing to lay eggs that more and more worker bees are present in the colony. Did you add anything to that? No, I, I mean, I would just say, if you didn't mention it, it's, it's about five weeks, four to five weeks between when the egg is laid and the winged adults emerge. So there's this, you know, bumblebees have this very interesting life cycle and that sort of half of their lives are spent in, in a solitary phase and half of them are in a social phase and that the queen you know, from the time she enters hibernation until the time that those workers emerge is essentially in a, in, a, in a solitary phase. And then once those workers emerge, it begins the social phase of the bees life cycle. Um, so it's kind of an interesting um, mix between our solitary bees and say honeybees that are truly social or, or you social anyway. Um, but yeah, it's about five weeks between when, that, when the egg is, is laid and when uh, the worker, the first brood of workers emerge. And typically the queen doesn't start laying her second brood of eggs until that first one emerges. So um, it's like 10 weeks until the, the second brood of, of workers emerge typically, maybe a little less than that. And I just saw another question pop up here from Lynette. Um, so yes, the queen is actually pregnant all winter long. Um, she mates in the fall and stores the sperm um, in uh, an apparatus within her body and actually then sort of uses that sperm strategically. Um, if she fertilizes the egg, it will develop into a female, either a worker or, or a queen, depending on the resources that are fed to it. But the queen can also choose, and, and how this actually happens from a physiological perspective is a bit of a mystery still, um, to not fertilize that egg. And if that happens, the egg will actually develop into a male. And this is an interesting, um, method of sex determination called haplodiploidy or single loci sex determination. We don't need to go into a genetics lesson here, but it's, <laughs> it's very interesting, you know, just from a sociobiology perspective and a biology perspective, but it's also very relevant for conservation because what happens is if a, if a female actually fertilizes that egg with 
two copies of the same gene at that sex determination loci, instead of developing into a female, it can actually develop into a sterile male that cannot reproduce. And this means that, that inbreeding depression can happen very quickly amongst bumblebees and enter what we call an extinction vortex really quickly. So um, much quicker than say you'd see in, in, in mammals or birds or other animals that have the same sex determination that we do in, in, in humans, which is this X and Y chromosome, two Xs, traditionally defined as a female and X and a Y traditionally defined as a male. That's how we work. It's, it's very different in the bumblebee world. Um, I don't need to go into more detail than that, but, but it's a good question. Lots of interesting biology to talk about. Um, what happens to a colony if the current queen dies or doesn't produce sufficient queen substance? I, I assume that last question is sort of referring to the similar behavior or, or physiology we see in honeybees of, of producing a royal jelly, but you can probably answer the rest of that question, Katie, go for it. Yeah, so if the queen dies, um, it's likely that that colony will also die. There may be some female worker bees that attempt to pick up the egg laying, um, but again, with what Rich was saying about haplodiploidy, it's really spotty about whether or not those individuals that come out are going to be able to reproduce. So I think it's been said that this happens more often than we know. Rich, would you agree with that, that colonies don't reproduce? Yeah, I think that probably happens fairly, yeah. fairly regularly, um, more, more often than we know. Um, but I, I do think that workers would start laying eggs very likely. And I think they even try to lay eggs when the queen is in the nest. Um, and the queen quickly eats those eggs. So that doesn't happen. But those worker eggs, because they're, they haven't mated, would all develop into males. So the, the, the workers could produce males and the colony could potentially then spread its gametes that way. But they're not going to produce queens that would start a new colony the following year. Um, and maybe we should push this last question to tomorrow. Um, <laughs> are we able to identify cuckoo bees? <laughs> What's the likelihood that we'll come across one? Yes, tomorrow will be all about identification and we will go over the cuckoo bees. So stay tuned. <laughs> and then females, my understanding is um, that the animal develops into a queen due to the amount of resources that they're fed. So um, if it, it, it's similar to we would see in our nutrition, the more we're fed, the better we're fed, the better we develop. And so a, an animal that's fed or, or a worker bee, I'm sorry, a larvae that's fed additional resources, given additional resources grows faster and their ovaries become more mature and the individual becomes larger, making it essentially a, a fertile queen that can mate. Um, so I think that answers those last two questions. If anything else pops up, Katie, I'm gonna let you handle it. I'm gonna start sharing my screen here so I can dive into status and threats. And can I just get a acknowledgement from you that you can see my screen? Yes, it looks good. Okay, great, thanks. All right, um, so Katie gets the joy of of sharing all the fun, exciting ecology with you, and I get to depress you with <laughs> threats and conservation. No, I, I hopefully it's not a a, a, a down it downy. Um, hopefully this is not a depressing talk, because I think one of the great things about pollinator conservation in general is is there actually is something that we can do about it. We can we can put better habitat on the landscape, and at this point we're still largely in a build it and they will come scenario. Uh, I think we've done a lot of things to the environment that have made the situation difficult for bees, but we can turn that around. And it's all things that are within our grasp if we can work together and be collaborative as we work forward, as we move forward and create a better landscape. And collecting data from an atlas like this is a great way to make sure we're doing things in the right way. The bumblebee conservation story in North America begins with the four species that you see on your screen here. Um, in the mid-1990s, there was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Robin Thorpe. 
He spent his career at UC Davis and he dedicated his career to, um, to the study of native beasts and spent a lot of time studying um, bumblebees. And in the mid 1990s, he was, uh, he was looking at populations of bumblebees in Northern California and Southern Oregon. And over the course of a few years, he had two species, the two species you see on the left or left hand side of your screen here, the Western bumblebee and Franklin's bumblebee that disappeared from his study sites. And um, just with really no explanation whatsoever. And at that time, Robin sort of raised the red flag across the United States and said, hey, we're, we're experiencing some severe declines in the Western US on two particular species. What are, what are the rest of you seeing? And other researchers in the Eastern United States um, noticed a significant decline in the rusty patch bumblebee, um, which is more or less native from once upon a time, at least from, from North Dakota to Maine down through Georgia and the yellow-banded bumblebee, um, Bombus tricola, which is sort of native to the northern tier of the, um, of the United States and into southern Canada, all the way up into Alaska. <clears throat> um, and so at that time, we really recognized that there were a lot of problems and potentially we needed to start changing the way that we were doing things to protect bumblebees. And I just want to put this slide back up that Katie shared earlier with uncertainty. There are a ton of uncertainties about native bees in general um, and some really specific uncertainties about bumblebees and, and Katie mentioned all of those. And I'm going to dive now into the threats and stressors for bumblebees. And, and I just want to highlight that we can't go back in time and see what happened to those species of bumblebee. We can't, it's impossible. Right? So the, the best thing that we can do is, is to look at correlations and to try to put pieces together with the evidence that we have. It is imperfect. We do not have sort of a smoking gun um, and we, we probably never will have one. Well, the best thing that we can do is put the evidence together and build a picture that likely explains what has happened. And I'm gonna show you some of that evidence tonight, but I just wanna let you know that there are a lot of uncertainties around this, but Despite the fact that there are uncertainties, the scale of insect declines that we have seen across the globe are disturbing enough that something needs to be done now. There are some, some studies from Germany and, and other areas that have experienced upwards of a 50% decline in insect biomass over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, and that level of biomass loss may seem like it's not that big of a deal, it's just biomass. But when you think about the fact that, that birds and, and, and small mammals and even grizzly bears are eating insects as a major component of their diet, that loss in biomass of insects will cascade up the food chain rapidly and lead to declines in many other taxa. So this is a huge thing. And so at this point, we're uh, of the belief that, that even if we don't know the specific reason for these declines, we need to do something and we need to do something now. And it could be that what we do now uh, is only gonna delay things and not solve things. But we can't wait until we have the best answers to act or we're gonna see you know, cascading effects across the ecosystem. And an example of this, and I think a, a really apt example of this is typical sort of pollinator, pollinator conservation says, put more flowers on the landscape, plant more flowers. And I think that's a great thing to do. We should all be planting more flowers on the landscape. It's certainly gonna support the bees that are out there. But it very well could be, and we honestly don't know this, that nesting resources are the limiting factor for bumblebees and for other species of native bees. And if that's true, just putting flowers on the landscape actually won't solve the problem. We need to figure out what nesting resources are important for these bees and put those things on the landscape. But the flowers hopefully can help sort of delay the inevitable and delay that time until we can get the information that we need so we can do projects like the Great Plains Bumblebee Atlas and get the data we need to make better land management recommendations. And so one of the things that, that we've done at the Xerxes Society to try to move this in the right direction is, is to write this book, it's called Conserving Bumblebees. It talks about how to manage lands with the bumblebee life cycle in mind 
it, it outlines th the threats I'm going to talk about tonight. It provides management recommendations. It provides timing recommendations. And these are using sort of the best available data that we had at the time this book was written. They're getting better. We're, we're improving these recommendations, but it's still, you know, very pertinent advice. So this is a book that um, is, is a free PDF download from our website and, and would encourage you, particularly if you're managing lands, um, to take a look at it and, and to think about it. And, you know, it's also important, and I can acknowledge that this is sort of single species or single group, you know, management, and we need to manage ecosystems for many species. So these are just recommendations and advice, and we need to figure out how it fits into the larger picture. Um, but once we found out those four species of bumblebees were in decline, one of the things that, that we did to try to get more data, to learn more so that we can make better evidence-based recommendations about conservation was we formed or helped to form the IUCN Bumblebee Specialist Group. And this is a network of 75 bumblebee experts and specialists all over the world that are, um, you know, have the goal of one, assessing the extinction risk of bumblebees in the species uh, of bumblebees in the world of which there are around 265 species and then also to think about conservation action and thinking about what we can really do and, and putting some recommendations out there um, at this point we have assessed the bumblebees of the Americas so of the western hemisphere and in North America Mesoamerica and South America and we're beginning to do some work in, in the rest of, of the world. Um, and just in case you're interested here, the, all of the colored um, regions of this map that are not gray have native bumblebees. Um, areas that are gray, largely in the southern hemisphere, um, in the eastern uh, hemisphere, have no native bumblebees. Um, but here in North America, what we found is around a quarter of our bumblebees, so Katie told you there's around 50 species, um, and around a quarter of them are facing some degree of extinction risk. So four of those fell into what we call a critically endangered category, two of them into an endangered category, five of them are, are assessed as vulnerable and one was assessed as, as near threatened. You know, that still means that three quarters of them are, are, are uh, least concern or, or what we call data deficient, meaning we need more information. So this outlines, you know, some priorities of things that we can work on here in the United States and some species that we can look at and hopefully start thinking about actions. Uh, this is the list of, of bumblebees that overlap with the central United States. There are nine species on this list. I've mentioned a couple of them already tonight. Uh, Katie has as well. So Bombus aphanus, uh, the rusty patch bumblebee is at the top of this list. Um, Bombus sucklii, suckley cuckoo's bumblebee is a, uh, a cuckoo bumblebee that, that Katie mentioned that is also on this list. Um, and, and in the region, Bombus variabilis is another cuckoo bumblebee on this list. Um, Bombus fraternus, the southern plains bumblebee. Bombus fervidus, the yellow bumblebee. Morrison's bumblebee, Bombus morrisoni. The western bumblebee, Bombus occidentalis. The American bumblebee, uh, Bombus pensilvanicus. And then Bombus tricola. Uh, the yellow banded bumblebee. So all of those overlap with some portion uh, of, of the region. And we have these species and we're left with these questions. How do we prioritize conservation? What should we do for these animals? Uh, the status of these animals is underneath them right here in terms of, uh, it's the same, a very similar list of species, although there are a couple on here that don't overlap with, with the Great Plains. But these are the species in North America we need to do something about. And one of the things that has been done is some of these species have been petitioned for endangered species protection. And by endangered species protection, I mean federal, federally endangered. And, and a couple of these have actually already been listed. So the rusty patch bumblebee, um, which is here, was listed as endangered in 2017. And it, as I mentioned earlier, it overlaps with North Dakota and South Dakota. Um, so potential to find that species in this atlas project. And then Franklin's bumblebee is also listed as endangered. That species is native to Southern Oregon and Northern California um, and is not going to be found in this atlas, but we're hoping to find it in the California and the Pacific Northwest bumblebee atlas. Um, likewise, there's a few species that overlap um, with this project that have been petitioned for listing, including the suckley cuckoo bumblebee, the American bumblebee, um, 
and uh, well, the, the yellow banded bumblebee was petitioned, but deemed not warranted for listing by the Fish and Wildlife Service. <clears throat> there are, of course, other things that we can do. And, and one of those things is to just do more of a search effort to find out actually what's happening with some of these species. And um, the Southern Plains bumblebee, as I mentioned, is on that list of IUCN red list species for which we, we need to find out more information. And when we did the um, assessment for this species uh, in the IUCN red list, it came up as endangered. And so one of the things that is needed though, especially in the central portion of the United States, search effort over the last 10, 15, even up to 20 or 30 years is pretty poor up and down this corridor. And so collecting more data throughout the Northern and Southern Great Plains is gonna add a lot of information to our understanding of the species. And just to give you some idea of what's possible, you know, five years ago before we launched uh, the, the Nebraska bumblebee atlas, there was very little known about this species, but um, the, the Nebraska, or, or the status of the species throughout the region. But the Nebraska bumblebee atlas has turned up a lot of records of this species. It seems to be doing potentially better than we thought it was. We found 17 new county records and it's been detected throughout the state. Um, so it's very possible that we could find similar things in, in South Dakota and in Kansas and help to determine that the species is actually more stable than we thought it was. It's also possible that we won't find it in those places and that for some reason, Nebraska seems to be a stronghold, but we currently don't have the data to tell these things and, and learning more about it will be, will be significantly important. Um, likewise, uh, the Western bumblebee Bombus occidentalis, the very Eastern edge of its range overlapped with North Dakota and South Dakota. Um, in fact, there was an observations of the species in 2020 in South Dakota in the Black Hills. Um, and it's possible we could redetect the species um, throughout more of the potential region. So there's some, some needed search area for the species throughout the western portion of those two states. And so the question lies, um, what's going on? That's sort of the status of bumblebees that, as we understand it, particularly in the region where we're talking about right now. And so what's going on? Why, why are all these bumblebees declining? Um, what, what's happening in the landscape? And I think this cartoon here um, does a good job of laying it out. <laughs> There's no single factor that's causing any things to happen. Um, we've taken a lot of factors, including disease and, and, and habitat loss and climate change and pesticides, and we're throwing them all at these bees. And, and then at the same time, they have this unique genetic makeup that, that influences and, and interact, changes how they sort of are, are able to reproduce. And I talked about how quickly they can enter um, an extinction vortex as their populations get smaller and smaller. So th this, is, this is the scenario here is that we have all these individual factors that are acting on the bees, but they're also interacting with each other and, and adding on to it. it. It's similar to how you and I go through the world. If we're stressed out about family or work or any number of things, and then all of a sudden someone throws a disease at us or a pathogen at us, we can get sicker than, than we normally would if we were healthy and not stressed out. And the same thing basically is happening to the bees out there. And so there was a paper written last year that, that sort of laid this out of, of calling it more death by a thousand cuts, you know, not death by a single big cut, but there's so many little factors acting on these animals. And so we asked the question, <laughs> how strong is the camel's back? How long can, can bees and other insects and invertebrates withstand these, these continuing threats on the landscape. And um, I'm now gonna walk you through sort of the four, what we believe are the main drivers of, of bumblebee decline. And again, wanna remind you that we don't sort of have any um, um, smoking gun here. We don't know that these are the things causing declines, but we've gathered evidence and believe that there are some, some significant factors here. The first one we're going to talk about is, um, is managed pollinators. And these managed pollinators are believed to be the driving behind those four main species that we talked about at the beginning of this talk. Those four bumblebee species, the Western bumblebee, Franklin's bumblebee, the rusty patch bumblebee, and the yellow banded bumblebee, 
are all in the same subgenus, um, which means they're very closely related. And it's believed that diseases that were spread and amplified by the commercial bumblebee industry actually led to the rapid decline in those four species. Um, and the, and so what, what happened in this story is in the mid 1990s, well, starting in the mid 1990s, we, our consumption of tomatoes started to go up and growers learned that we could produce tomatoes year round if we started to grow them in greenhouses. And as you learned earlier, bumblebees are very good pollinators um, of tomatoes because they require buzz pollination, or at least they benefit from buzz pollination. So industry created a novel solution to that novel problem of increasing fruit set in the greenhouse by learning how to grow bumblebees in boxes and then shipping those boxes you know, to, to greenhouses where they could pollinate. Unfortunately, what's belie believed to have happened is those, um, those laboratories contracted an, uh, a pathogen called Nosema bombi and had a bit of an outbreak in those facilities, but um, those animals developed some resistance to it in the lab, um, but then the animals were shipped all over the country with this pathogen in it, Nosema bombi, which is a fungal pathogen. And uh, unfortunately, greenhouses are not sealed. So bumblebees can fly out of greenhouses and, and visit flat plants outside. And likewise, other bumblebees can fly into greenhouses and, and visit the tomato flowers inside of them. And it's believed in that process that this pathogen was actually spread and amplified by these commercial pollinators causing pretty catastrophic disease, particularly in those four species, but, but potentially in other species throughout North America as well. And this is an unregulated industry. We have no idea where these animals are being shipped, how many of them are being shipped, um, or really what's happening. So this is a this is a major thing that we need to start thinking about. And as I mentioned, there's some uncertainty about this. We can't go back in time and, and actually show that these pathogens are what caused this. But this is the paper that really talks about or, or lays this out. I'm not going to go into great detail, but basically all you need to know here is on the y-axis is the amount of this pathogen found in the bees. And on the x-axis here is time. So for instance, this is the rusty patch bumblebee. And if we go way, way back in time, we find very low incidence of Nosema bombay. And then in the mid 1990s, when we started shipping commercial bumblebees all over the country, we see a spike in Nosema bombay that coincides with this catastrophic decline that we saw in that species. Same thing in Bombus occidentalis, we see very low incidences of that species, and then a spike um, in the mid 1990s when that novel, when, when commercial bumblebee industry took off. We see the same thing in the American bumblebee, but we don't see it in all species. We don't see it in more stable species like Bombus tricola, that yellow banded bumblebee that I told you the Fish and Wildlife Service determined was not warranted for endangered species listing. So, so this explains the timing, the scale, the scope um, of this seems to coincide with the declines that we've seen, at least in those three species of, of bees. So, so the commercial bumblebee industry is certainly a threat to native bees. Um, honeybees are another potential source of threat for, for native bees. Um, there are a lot of people out there that have, have wanted to help bees. And in order to do that, they've decided to become backyard beekeepers. And I think it's important to recognize that there are many reasons um, to keep honeybees, um, but, bee, but conservation is not one of them. Um, Honeybee keeping is, is a wonderful hobby. They're beautiful, beautiful animals, and you can learn a ton from them. You can get honey from it, and you can help educate your neighbors. Um, but hopefully you've learned so far that, that honeybees are not native to North America. They were brought here in the 1600s. Um, they're brought here for sugar and for wax, but they're not native species. They're largely a managed species. Like, um, a similar situation to think about that would be parallel is a lot of people have chickens in their backyards and they use those chickens for eggs. And egg, they're beautiful animals. Chickens are really neat, beautiful animals. But you don't hear people saying that they have chickens in their backyard for bird conservation because they don't. <laughs> they're not practicing bird conservation. They're keeping chickens, right, to, for eggs. And that's the same situation for honeybees. You don't keep honeybees for bee conservation. You keep honeybees for honey 
um, and, and for wax if you use it. And so what we know about honeybees is when we introduce them to say a, a, an urban or suburban backyard, um, there's a lot of mouths to feed in a honeybee hive. There's you know, up to 50,000 individuals in a single hive and, and research has shown that a honeybee hive, a single honeybee hive can actually extract the pollen equivalent of a significant number of native bees. So they're removing, they're kind of like herbivores or grazers that are removing floral resources and therefore competing with our native bees. And this is not something that's really benefiting bee conservation, it's just benefiting those honeybees. Um, additionally, we've also learned that, um, bump, that honeybees are, are spreading pathogens and diseases to our native bees when they interact on flowers. So there are a lot of DNA and RNA virus, viruses that are transmitted on flowers when honeybees and native bees interact. And so these are concerning factors. So I'm not telling you to not be a honeybee keeper. And if you are, that's great, no problem. But I wouldn't say get into honeybee keeping to save the bees because you're, you're very likely not saving <laughs> the bees. You may, you may be doing the opposite. You know, honeybees are not an endangered species. Their populations are largely quite healthy. Um, there are you know, millions and millions of hives all over the world. There are some declines that are happening in honeybees, but it's largely an agricultural issue that's happening because of farm practices. And so we need to change farm practices to make these farm animals healthier on those farms. And that's, what, that's where we need to make those changes for honeybees. Um, so that really handles managed pollinators. We're gonna talk a little bit about pesticides here. And again, um, just wanna throw some uncertainty at you. This is. There's a lot of things that we don't know about the effects of pesticides on bumblebees and other native bees, and that's largely because nobody's looking at it. The, um, the, the main sort of test animal for, for the effect of pesticides on bees is to look at them in honeybees. But we've told you tonight that honeybees are very different than our native bees. They have this highly social um, structure and they live in boxes and they're moved around and they can be moved away from pesticides when they're sprayed and then moved back in afterwards. Um, and so we don't know largely how, how a lot of these things are impacting our, our native bees. And that's partially because um, they have different path, pathways for, of exposure than honeybees. So we can test the effect of say direct contact on honeybees and we can uh, assess indirect contact. So if we spray something on a plant and then a bee visits it, what happens to the bee? And then we can look at systemic in insecticides and see how that affects um, bees as well. But we have no idea how contaminated nest materials that are brought back, those, those leaf cutter bees that, that Katie talked about earlier, they're lining their nest with leaves that are cut from plants. If those plants have been treated with an insecticide, What's the effect on the larvae that develop in, in those nests? Um, likewise, what all these species, Katie told you that two thirds of, of bees nest in the ground. If they're just in the ground, in the water table basically, and pesticides are moving through the soils, what's the impact on the, on the bees that are developing underground? We can't study that with honeybees, it's impossible um, because they don't live underground. <laughs> So, so there's a lot of unknowns around this and we need to do a better job of studying this. And, and one of the main reasons is, is, is we're just vastly increasing the use of these chemicals on the landscape, particularly in, in the Great Plains. If you look at the map on the far right here, you know, large swaths of our country are using highly toxic insecticides. This is a product called imidacloprid. It's a neonicotinoid insecticide that is systemic, which means it's water soluble. You, you apply it to the soil or you apply it to the plant and it is actually absorbed by that plant and expressed in every tissue. So it's expressed in the leaves, so it's protected against herbivores, but it also is expressed in the pollen and in the nectar, which makes it available to the non-target organisms like bees. And Katie told you earlier that bees only eat pollen and nectar. It's their only source of food. So if all the food that they're getting is pollen and nectar from plants that are treated from insecticides, they're getting a micro dose of an insecticide every single time that they eat or that they larvae eat as they're developing. And so this is going to cause 
what we call sublethal effects to bees. It's not going to kill them immediately, but it affects their ability to forage efficiently. It, it affects their ability to navigate in the landscape. It affects their ability to reproduce. And all of these things over time are going to create slow population declines that are going to lead to some of the things that we're seeing out in the landscape. And it's unfair for us to just talk about agriculture when we, when we think about some of these insecticides, because the same products are actually available over the counter. You can go out to you know, any of these big box stores and purchase the same chemical over the counter. And frankly, you don't need any license or training to do this. Farmers um, and, and other applicators have to apply for a pesticide applicator's license and go through a series of training. And there's also an economic incentive to use the least amount of, of product um, that is effective. Homeowners don't have that same level of training and don't have the same level of understanding. A lot of people probably don't even read the label um, or, or, or not very thoroughly. And so they might apply this every single year you know, to try to treat their plants. And that's sort of how these products is, are sold as, as sort of being prophylactic protection uh, against pests that aren't even there. Um, but that can have a really dramatic effect. And, and the, the picture here is, is a event that happened in Oregon back in 2013, where there was a series of European linden trees in a parking lot that were, that were sprayed with one of these highly toxic chemicals to try to control aphids that were simply dropping honeydew on some cars. So they, they applied this highly toxic insecticide. All the trees were in flower, and there was thousands, tens of thousands of bumblebees that were visiting those trees and they were just raining dead out of that tree. I took these pictures and literally as I was taking it, I could hear bee carcasses, you know, hitting the ground or hitting the pavement all around me. Um, and so, you know, this is an example of, of a highly toxic insecticide that had no place in this landscape. There was no reason that this product had to be applied and the consequences were tens of thousands of dead bumblebees and hundreds of colonies that were affected by it. Um, and so this is the largest you know, known pesticide poisoning of bumblebees. It, it killed many, many animals. Um, and, and thankfully, some good things came from this. You know, laws have changed here in Oregon and in other places around the country because of it. But there, there's a lot of, you know, this is still going on. We still get reports of, of bee kills similar to this every single year. Um, another source of, of insecticides are nursery plants. A lot of perennials and, and other plants out there are actually pre-treated with some of these insecticides so that they look pretty on the shelves and sell faster. Um, but if they're pre-treated with one of these insecticides, it means they're still gonna be expressed in the, in the pollen and the nectar of the plants that you're planting potentially to try to help the bees. So we need to really do a good, a good job of, of being educated when we, when we buy our plants and making sure to ask our nursery if they've been pre-treated with insecticides. And if they don't know the answer to that question, I suggest you take your business elsewhere. And if they do know and they are, you should also take your business elsewhere. So we need to support nurseries that are practicing bee safe practices. We do know that, that after a single application, particularly in, in woody plants, can be around for seven years after just a single application of some of these chemicals. Um, so there's lots of things that we can do to fix this, particularly in our ornamental landscapes. And what we really ask you to do at Therese's is to practice what we call a systems approach. Um, and this means to sort of think about your garden as an ecosystem. And if you see a pest in your garden, like aphids or caterpillars or something else that's that's impacting your garden, it's likely that there's some part of your garden that's missing. It could be a plant that would attract a predator, or it could be that you're trying to grow plants in a wet spot when it doesn't belong in a wet spot. And so instead of sort of using a chemical to fix your system, what we're asking you to do is to just play with it, have fun with it, be a gardener, you know, um, put some different plants in there and see if you can create an ecosystem that helps manage itself and reduces the need for chemical inputs. We can do this, but to do it, we have to sort of rethink what, what is beautiful and, and what's damaging. And so Katie told you earlier about um, 
about leaf cutter bees, and this is what their holes look like when they're cut out of out of leaves. And someone might take a look at that tree and say, "Oh my gosh, there's some pest that's eating all of all of my tree, and so I need to spray one of these toxic insecticides on it." And if they do that, then that bee is going to be bringing you know those those leaves and 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 lining their babies basically with with an insecticide. And so we need to do things like leave holes there and help protect some of these animals. Not every insect you see, and I know you all know this, is, is bad. There are a lot of very good insects. In fact, you know, over 90% of the insects that we see on the landscape are beneficial. Um, Xerces uh, Resource Center has a ton more information to learn about pesticides and to learn their impacts and how we can reduce their impacts um, on, on pollinators and other invertebrates. Um, in addition to managed pollinators and pesticides, if that wasn't enough, we're also experiencing a, a lot of habitat loss out there. We've taken our, our grasslands and our prairies, which once upon a time, you know, provided food for the entirety of the life cycle. And we learned earlier during the, the ecology portion of this talk that, you know, the life cycle of a bumblebee is, is 15, 20, maybe 25 weeks uh, until those reproductive members are produced. So they need flowering resources for that entire period in order to actually successfully reproduce for the following year. And while grasslands and prairies once, a, once upon a time provided that resource, what we've converted them to in, in, in agricultural fields, while they may provide some flowering, resor flowering resources, only flower for you know maybe two or three weeks. And that's just not long enough to support bumblebee populations. And that says nothing about sort of the concrete areas that we're building or grass that we're planting that actually provide zero flowering resources for those bees. And so the loss of, of food for these animals on the landscape is certainly having a factor. And we're seeing this at a landscape scale. If you look at sort of the, the conversion rate of, of grasslands and prairies to, to agriculture, we have lost you know, a significant portion of our native grasslands in, in this country. And, um, and then and if you do a corollary study that looks at decrease in, in, in bees, it's happening in the same location. We're losing bees where we're losing grasslands. And so we need to do a better job of protecting these habitats. Um, and, and, you know, I said this when these photos were on the slide earlier, but, you know, these types of habitats that we're seeing in, the, in these pictures don't provide any habitat for native bees or really any other native species. Green lawn, while it may look neat and tidy, doesn't provide habitat for any native species that I'm, that I'm aware of and may actually increase the chances of getting pests into your garden. Um, so, so what we need to do is to try to find ways to build a little bit of habitat in there. It doesn't mean you need to get rid of all of your green grass, but you know, in some of these brown areas that we see, uh, you know, in this around this home here, we could plant some native flowers in here in all these areas and provide some food. Um, there's opportunities to do this, and and we can do it together. Um, but we need to think about this sort of at the local and the landscape level. So we need to create habitat wherever we can in our parks and backyards. And I know that many of you are doing this, and thank you for the, all that you're doing, you know, to to help build this. We now need to work as communities to, to connect those habitats using you know, riparian corridors, rights of way, roadsides, power lines. All of these things can be really important to help us to connect all of these landscapes and to, to provide more habitat and ways for these bees to interact to create healthy populations. So we need to be creating you know, habitat everywhere. Think like a bee and how they move around and how they forage and create habitat in all those places that will support them. We know that gardens can be really important. There's a lot of studies that have come out of especially the UK that, that show that, that nesting and foraging habitat can be really important in these areas. And so, you know, we need to, we need to think about creating new habitat. Lawns, as I mentioned, don't have a lot of habitat. There's, you know, one to four species in there. How can we increase biodiversity in lands in those lands to, to increase the number of species that are that are using those. So, so put some, some more flowering species in your landscape. Create a yarden, I love this word, the yarden. Um, I, I created a yarden in my front yard. I have now have a native prairie in my front yard. 
Some of my neighbors think I'm crazy, <laughs> but I love it. I have insects flying there now. It's just starting to bloom. I've got, I think I counted just this morning, I've got 12 different species in bloom in my front yard right now. Um, so really exciting. I've seen tons of bees and it's only the first year. It's been a really fun, fun project. And so, you know, the best thing to do if you're gonna do this is to plant native plants. Um, our animals uh, that are native evolved with native plants a lot of our bees, actually not so much bumblebees, but a lot of our other ground nesting bees are actually specialists and they are dependent on a very narrow range of plants, sometimes a single genus, sometimes even a single species. So we wanna make sure to put those food plants on the landscape to support those bees in addition to the common ones. We don't wanna create habitat that's just making common bees more common. We wanna create habitat that's supporting all of the biodiversity out there. And because of this, we really want to avoid highly cultivated plants and garden varietals. A lot of those have just been bred for looks, they're double petaled, and they just don't, they don't provide any food for, for um, any insects at all. And then, you know, plant those plants on the landscape so that they're blooming from early spring through late fall to help support the overlapping, you know, iterations of species as well as that super long life cycle for bumblebees. And then we also need to create nesting resources on the landscape. And this is just your opportunity to be a little bit lazy in, in part of your yard. Let some grass overgrow, leave a brush pile, leave a compost pile outside. All of these areas are, are gonna be great areas and encourage bees and other insects to come nest, beneficial insects to nest in, in your yard. We started a campaign a few years ago called, called Leave the Leaves. This is incredibly important for, for many different invertebrate species, but bumblebees in particular, for that overwintering phase, they need that leaf litter to help insulate them against our cold winters. So leaving those leaves until the following spring, particularly in sort of your less kempt areas, not necessarily on green grass, but you know, in your gardens and beds and things like that, leaving that, that leaf layer to protect those invertebrates is incredibly um, important. And likewise, thinking about that overwintering phase and making sure that there's spaces in your garden and, ha and home for them is, is really important. And then lastly, you know, on top of the threats we've already talked about, of course, climate change is impacting all of us. Um, we're seeing rising temperatures you know, through, throughout the world. Um, and, and, and really, instead of just rising temperatures, we're also just seeing extreme weather events. Last June here in Portland, Oregon, it was 119 degrees. Crazy hot, never been that hot before. <laughs> Hopefully never that hot again. And I know that you've experienced similar things in the Great Plains there of these radical shifts in temperature from very cold to very hot. And these things are not beneficial for these animals as they're just trying to get started. Remember these bumblebee queens are in their solitary life phase right now before they have support from workers. And so a major, a major weather event can actually just, if it impacts that queen, that whole colony doesn't stand a chance of, of reproducing. And these, you know, the climate that's changed, evidence suggests that, that actually bumblebees are losing habitat from the southern portion of the range. So we're losing bumblebees from the south, but they don't seem to be expanding northward into habitats there. They likely don't provide habit, um, habitat for a long enough period to allow those species to reproduce. So bumblebees seem to be stuck in what we call a climate vise. Um, and this is gonna have, you know, could have drastic effects on the ecosystem if it moves forward. And so, as I mentioned before, there's so much we can do about this. We can create nature-based solutions to climate change. All of those um, things I talked about in terms of putting native plants in your garden, are they increase biodiversity but they also increase carbon sequestration. There's a lot of um, scientific evidence out there that suggests that if we just do some restoration and increase biodiversity, we're, we can help solve that problem at the same time, but we can also sequester around 20% of the carbon that we need to help keep carbon in check. So, so by doing habitat restoration, we're not only protecting these animals, but we're also helping affect the long-term impacts of climate change. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, you know, we do have a, a program called Bee City USA at Xerces that helps communities work on these things together. There's some affiliates in Nebraska and likely in other areas throughout the region. Um, and other things that you can do is do things like 
participate in community science, help us collect data. Um, and you're hopefully gonna do that by participating in, in one of our Bumblebee Atlas projects and specifically the Great Plains Bumblebee Atlas. We're now running these Atlas projects in 10 different states throughout um, west of the Mississippi and you know, hopefully gonna expand e eastward and, and in the Intermountain West in the years to come to help gather these important data that, that will help us learn more about why these species are in decline and what we can do to protect them. Um, you know, the first step in conservation is finding out where these animals live. And, and that is our, you know, sort of initial goal, but then also learning their habitat associations and other things, you know, can help us to make better land management recommendations in the years to come for all of these federal and state agencies that are helping to manage the lands that we all own together. So um, with that, I think I'm going to say I've covered those fairly well, and I will take any questions if there are any. If there are any questions. <laughs> that was wonderful. I think you did a really good job covering the wide variety of topics very concisely. Um, there are a few questions. It wasn't that concise, but thanks. <laughs> um, I think this one is relating to the last session. Do you do they do bumblebees have royal jelly like honeybees? Not that I understand. I do not believe that they do. I believe that queens are sort of fed additional resources, and that's what led, leads to the additional development of, of their ovaries and, and their size, that it's more resources than it is some special food that they're fed. Okay. Um... John Vogel is asking if the Conserving Bumblebee book includes management recommendations for those with backyard pollinator gardens, as well as those managing larger acreage. I would say it's mostly written for the larger acreage for sort of the, um, you know, the, the Forest Service, BLM type habitats out there, you know, land trusts, larger acreages. But it doesn't mean that the principles that are in there couldn't be used by a backyard gardener. That they're just not specifically written with that in mind. But you could certainly read through there, think about the recommendations, and and apply some of them in your yard. There's also, you know, plant lists and, and other other resources that it would direct you to. Um, Missy asked, referring back to. Um, disease with the commercial bumblebees. Do they know why Bombus tricola didn't have a spike? My guess is that its range largely didn't overlap with regions with significant proportions of greenhouses. Um, but, but I know that they have a lot of greenhouse use up in Canada that overlaps with its range. So I, I don't know. It's a, it's a good and interesting question. Um, that I think is, is worth thinking more, more deeply about. But it, I think um, you're not the only person to notice that that was surprised by that result. All right, there's a couple of long ones in here. Do you wanna read through those? Uh, sure, let me just open. Um... Okay. I'll answer one while you look at the long ones. Okay. So Laura says, I have cute, adorable bumblebees nesting in my porch. They chase each other away, and then I later find some dead on my porch. Those actually sound like carpenter bees. If they're nesting in wood and they have holes that are about half inch, three quarters of an inch long, um, they do look very similar to bumblebees. They're large and black, but the way that you can tell the difference is that carpenter bees have a very shiny, hairless abdomen and bumblebees will have a hairy abdomen. And we'll talk more about both of those species tomorrow. Um, so the question from Jacob here is a, is, a, is a good and an interesting one about structure and how structure impacts bumblebee populations. Um, I assume we're sort of talking about vegetation structure. Um, and I think, I think largely, in this system, as well as most other systems, we're just trying to create the most heterogeneous landscapes that we possibly can. 
And if, if you read through the Conserving Bumblebees Guidelines book, we largely make the recommendation to impact sort of no more than a third of a habitat in, in any given year. And that's just because we don't want to create uniform sort of landscapes. Um, we want to create heterogeneity, create differences, and create spaces where, you know, some that are newer, some that are older, that are going to create just different opportunities, different species. It's sort of that intermediate disturbance hypothesis if you if you took ecology back in the day. And that's really what we're looking for. And, and yes, structure, you know, is important to that. There are some species of bumblebees that nest in trees, others that nest directly on the surface of the ground, and still others that nest, you know, a meter on, under the ground. And all of those different species are going to require a different structure in the landscape. And so, you know, creating diversity and heterogeneity is going to help create biodiversity, <laughs> generally speaking, but, but specifically for bumblebees. So, so structure is certainly important. And Jacob, if you're interested in, um, in some of the primary literature around this, I'd be more than happy to share some resources with you. Um, I can drop my email address in the chat if you, if you want to go deeper into this. I will say that a lot of the Xerces resources, I think Katie probably shared some resources with you along the way, but if you just go to our, our Pollinator Conservation Resource Center, a lot of our sort of fact sheets and things are actually cited, so you can get to the primary literature pretty quickly if you want. But if you want, you know, more direct resources from me, I'm I'm more than happy to to provide them for you. I'm having a hard time talking and reading at the same time, Katie. So I don't know if there's any other questions okay. here. Um, yes. Do bumblebees have parasites or pests? similar to varroa mites and small hive beetles. Yeah, they have their own sort of flora and fauna of all kinds of different pathogens and pests. Um, nothing as, as, you know, the varroa mite was, was sort of a, an introduced pathogen to honeybees, which is what's made it so virulent. And I don't know of a, of a similar thing in, in bumblebees, but there are certainly mites that live in and amongst them. and and how pathogenic they are, uh, I think remains to be seen. But certainly, it's oftentimes you can take a picture of a bumblebee and see mites, you know, sometimes hundreds of them even on their thorax, sometimes hiding right behind their head where they can't get groomed off. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of interesting ecologies that are happening there, um, for sure. Um, here's an interesting one. If you buy seeds, can they be pre-treated with chemicals? And what does it mean to be organic seeds? An organic seed would not be pre-treated with, with one of these. Um, and I would say, generally speaking, if you're buying wildflowers, uh, that they're not going to be pre-treated with an insecticide. Um, but they could be. <laughs> Certainly something like 97% of the corn and soybean seed that's sold in this country is pre-treated with neonicotinoids, such that they're just grown that way prophylactically without you know, any threat of pests whatsoever. Um, I don't think that's, I think that's largely not happening with the, with the you know, native flower seed industry, but it doesn't mean that the plants those seeds came from weren't treated with insecticides, right? It's possible that they were in their growth phase before the seeds were made that they were actually pre-treated or treated with, with those neonicotinoids, which would actually mean they would be inside the seed and then expressed in that entire plant. So buying organic seed would be the best way to insulate yourself against this. Um, yeah, using organic seed would, would, would mean that at least none of these highly toxic insecticides were used on those. You know, there are some chemicals that are approved for organic you know, agriculture, including seed production, but none of them are toxic to the degree of the chemicals that I was talking about in that series of slides that I just went through. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. I want to make sure we get through this last section before. Okay, I can, I'll look at the rest of these questions and type answers to them if, if needed. And I think that would help, um, maybe address some of these other questions. So I'll just type answers and I think you'll be able to see them in the Q&A. You should be able to see the answered questions in there. So I'll go ahead and type answers while you're talking, Katie. Okay.
All right, are you seeing the correct screen this time? Looks great, Katie. Perfect. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you a little precursor tonight of what the Great Plains Bumblebee Atlas is, um, a basic idea of how it works. And then tomorrow night, we're gonna dive into the details of everything. So the Atlas again is a collaboration between the Xerces Society and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And it includes North Dakota, South Dakota, and Kansas. And a lot of people ask why we focus on bumblebees, right? After we went over all the different kinds of native bees that there are. Um, but bumblebees are a very charismatic group. So most of us, regardless of having training or not, can recognize a bumblebee, right? They're big, they're fuzzy, they're loud. They kind of stumble upon the flowers. Um, but they're also a generalist species. So generalist meaning they're found in a wide variety of ecosystems compared to some of our other wild bees that may be restricted to a certain type of habitat like a wetland. Um, bumblebees will also forage on a wide variety of flowers. They're not really restrictive when it comes to foraging. They're gonna use what's there, so they might have preferences. Bumblebees also have a very long active season. So it gives us time to go out and conduct a lot of surveys on these species. Right, so depending on where you are, um, in Kansas, they're obviously more active than they are in North Dakota right now. But between the summer months of June and September, bumblebees are going to be out in all three of these states in pretty good numbers. And we also just learned from Rich that they are an imperiled group, right? We know that bumblebees need our help right now. And so getting people involved in looking for these big fuzzy bumblebees and writing down the habitats that they're in and recording their floral hosts really gathers that baseline data for us so that we can start to look at their population changes and monitor their distributions. You know, are they maybe shifting north or are some of the species shifting east or west? Um, and it helps us to fill in those knowledge gaps like when Rich was talking about, maybe it's nesting habitat that is the restricting factor, right? We're putting flowers down, but what if it's nesting? What if it's overwintering habitat? So learning more about these species at a very basic level helps us to look at the trends, inform these evidence-based recommendations that can go on to help land managers, policymakers, and people just trying to do better in supporting bumblebees. So the way that the project works is each state is divided up into grid cells. And as volunteers sign up for the project, you adopt one of these grid cells. And whatever grid cell you adopt means you're going to survey for bumblebees in that specific area. So you're welcome to adopt any grid cell you want. It can be the grid cell of your house where you live. It can be the grid cell of maybe a family member that has a large prairie that you wanna survey. It can be somewhere where you go on vacation. It can be a grid cell that you're driving through, there's a lot of different options that can go into what grid cell you want to adopt. After you adopt your grid cell, you complete your training, like what we're doing now. Um, and then you go out and you survey your grid cell at least twice, anytime between June and September. And then you submit that data and the results help us have an improved understanding of the region's bumblebees. And just to point out the gap in the states here, Nebraska does have a bumblebee that was going on that was launched in 2019. So they'll be heading into their fourth season this year. So everyone in these four states will be serving this summer. Each season, we will put out a suite of priority grid cells. And these priority grid cells are the areas where we really need your help during the summer. So this year, the priority grid cells are set based on where we know species of greatest conservation need are or have been recorded. Um, they could also be grid cells where there's very rich habitat, like the Black Hills. Um, it could be areas where there have been no bumblebee observations at all, and you wanna learn something about the area. So you're still welcome to conduct surveys and adopt grid cells that are not listed as priority this year. They're just not a priority cell. So we welcome surveys from all the grid cells. To adopt a grid cell, you go on to the website um, to bumblebeeatlas.org slash gpadopt, 
and you'll find a search bar there so you can zoom in and out of the cells you can search for an address you can search for a park um, you can play around to find out which grid cell you want to adopt and as people adopt grid cells they will begin to turn orange so once five people have adopted the same grid cell we close it off because we don't want everybody surveying in the same grid cell so grid cell adoption will open up after this workshop and will remain open. Um, but if you are going to plan on adopting one of the grid cells in a larger city within your state, I would recommend doing it sooner than later because once five people adopt it, the cell will be closed off. Um, then we have the online training sessions. So tomorrow night, we're gonna be going over everything that's listed in the handbook. We're gonna go over the data sheets, the Bumblebee identification guides, um, how to catch a bumblebee, how to identify a bumblebee, how to conduct your survey, what kinds of weather conditions you should be looking for. Everything you need to know will be going over tomorrow. And then following those trainings, um, we'll be offering a series of optional field days. So these will be short in-person events, about two hours. Um, we'll have a few events in each state this summer where you can come out into the field and practice swinging nets, practice handling bees, ask any questions you might have, and also connect with other volunteers that are in your area. So those dates and locations are listed on the website right now. Um, registration is not open yet though. So after you've got your training done, you're feeling confident, you're ready to go out and conduct your surveys, you go out on your own to your grid cell anytime between June and September and you bring your data sheets, and you conduct a survey. So all of our surveys are catch and release, so no bees are harmed in this process. Um, the way we get around that is by chilling the bees on ice for about five to 10 minutes, and it makes them immobile. So that allows us to take really high quality pictures of the bumblebees and upload them. And photography is really key in this project. So tomorrow and at the field trainings, we're going to spend a portion of the training going over how to take pictures of the bumblebees, what features need to be in focus, because this is ultimately what allows us to make those species identifications is seeing different characteristics and different angles of the bee to be able to tell which species it is. So once you've collected your data, got your pictures, then you submit your information to bumblebeewatch.org. Um, if you've ever used eBird, it's very similar to that platform. It's specific to bumblebees in Canada and the United States. There's over 100,000 observations right now from over 30,000 people. So it's pretty large and it continues to grow, which is amazing to see all the observations come in. The difference between this site and iNaturalist um, comes up a lot. All of the sightings that are submitted to Bumblebee Watch are verified by experts. So there's no crowdsourcing of identifications. They're all done by somebody who knows how to identify bumblebees. Um, the data also feeds directly into bumblebees of North America, which is the largest data set for bumblebees in North America. Um, and this data set is actively used by scientists and researchers to better understand the bumblebees in our areas. And so through Bumblebee Watch and these Atlas programs, we've really seen an explosion of observations take off. So in, in 2018 there, that was when the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee launched. And in 2019, Nebraska was launched. In 2020, Missouri was launched. And there was already a project in Minnesota, but they joined forces with us. So that all of these projects are comparable, right? We're all using the same data sheets. We're all taking the same pictures. We have the same methods. So we're gonna be able to look at species in these different regions. And from 2018 to 2021, we're looking at about 50,000 observations that came in in just those four summers. So with the help of community scientists, we are rapidly learning more about bumblebees, right? A few researchers in any given area could not do this amount of work in the same amount of time. And it's being turned around into habitat management guidance, um, bumblebee identification guides, really beautiful species accounts and profiles that deals with their habitat associations and their floral associations. So the data is being used. 
And the best part is that the people that are helping out with these projects and becoming community scientists are really enjoying their time out in the field. So at the end of each season, we send out a survey um, to ask the volunteers a few questions about their experience. And this question was, do you value your experience and did you learn about learn a lot about bumblebees? And most people strongly agreed or agreed. And when we ask if they were planning to participate again, again, most people are coming back for another season. So it's a really valuable project. It provides you an active role in pollinator conservation. And it's just a wonderful, fun thing to get involved with, right? You get connected with so many people and learn about bumblebees, right? It might not be something you ever thought you would do, but there are a lot of people that you can connect with that have like minds, right? So everyone in these pictures here probably never thought they would be going out and swinging nets catching bumblebees, but most people that do it tend to have a really good time and they submit wonderful data for us. Um, yeah, so these projects, they really do take a village. Um, looking forward to seeing what the Great Plains is able to accomplish in the next few years. So tomorrow night, um, make sure you're signed up for that if you want to learn how to participate, how to actually conduct surveys, all the nitty gritty stuff. It will be at the same time. Um, you should receive a link if you haven't already for that one tomorrow night. The Atlas Project has a Twitter account and a Facebook account where we post stuff about field days and workshops, um, general fun facts if you want to follow along. And we also have a Facebook group that is specific to Atlas volunteers in the Great Plains Bumblebee Atlas, the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas, and the Missouri Bumblebee Atlas. So that's a space for people to link up with people maybe in their area or ask questions or post a picture of a species or a plant that you might have seen and you're not sure what it was, or maybe you just saw something really cool and you want to show some other Atlas volunteers. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is the evaluation. So when we close the Zoom window, I imagine we'll have a few questions to go over before, but when you close the Zoom window, a webinar evaluation will pop up. Um, if you could take a few seconds to fill that out, it's not comprehensive, but it really helps us improve our programs in the future. And with that, thank you everyone for sticking it out for two hours with us tonight. It's really nice to see so many folks here tonight. There are a few questions here. Um, and uh, that one person, Heather asks, can we sign up for more than one grid cell? Always. <laughs> you can sign up for as many grid cells as you want, um, but do keep in mind the commitment. So we ask that whatever grid cell you sign up for, that you conduct at least two surveys per grid cell. So if you feel like you can do more than that, you're welcome to. Laura Markham wants to know when we're launching in the Great Lakes. <laughs> hopefully soon yeah we're yeah we're we're really there's a bunch of states that are interested we're we're hoping to launch there very soon we're we'll just keep our fingers crossed that that happens soon <laughs> but there there is some action there for sure um and then this must be someone from nebraska or missouri katie that's wondering if they automatically get the same grid they signed up for last year yes you are still signed up for last year. If you want to change your grid from last year, please let me know and we'll get that done. And Stacy wants to know if adopting a grid cell means signing up for just this year or is it you know, committing to three years of surveys or anything like that? Yes, so the Great Plains Bumblebee Atlas is committing to three years, um, hopefully beyond, but right now the project is only for three years. But I, th I think this individual user, just because I think you you basically just told Stacy she has to commit for three years or not participate. I think she's wondering if she adopts a grid cell. Does that just mean this year or, or does she have to participate in years two and year three? You don't have to participate. But you get to. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you have the time to participate and you would like to participate. 
in years two and three if you enjoy year one. Yeah, so, so the commitment of adopting a good cell just says you know, two, two surveys basically during the growing season. And then you will have met your commitment, but then next year you're just gonna adopt five more because it's so fun. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Um, there's been a number of questions about the, the, the webinar um, and when it'll be posted. We're gonna download the video. We spend a little time producing it, putting like a title slide and things on it and breaking it up into the, the different modules. But it, we aim to have it up on the, uh, on, the, on the project website within a week or so. Um, and I, I, put the, I put the page actually in the, early parts of the chat when this is going to the exact page where it will be. I'll see if I can pull that exact chat up. Here it is. Boom. So I'm going to drop it in the chat right now, the page on the project website where all of the modules will be posted ideally within about a week. It might be a little bit longer than that, um, depending on how long it takes us to produce them. But obviously, we know there are important resources to make available. And we'll definitely have them out before the season launches on June 1st. There's a question about submitting data outside of my grid sample from my backyard. Yes, um, we will cover that tomorrow. There's a few different ways you can make observations, but you're welcome to submit data from wherever you are. We just ask that within your grid cell, you conduct at least two surveys during the summer. Yeah, so, so adopting a good cell is sort of committing to survey there. But if you're traveling and want to do, and you see a beautiful place and you want to conduct a survey, but you haven't adopted that good cell, go ahead and do a survey and submit it there. It's totally, totally fine. More data is, is almost always better. So feel free to survey wherever you want to and also have permission to survey. And we'll go over all that those details tomorrow. Um, 